On June 26, 1997, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was released, setting off what would eventually become one of the most successful franchises ever. And if you've ever taken a look at any of the videos on my channel, you'd know that Harry Potter is one of my favorite series of all time. But for many years, I've only had the audiobook versions of the series to listen to. I went to college across the country and wasn't able to pack my own set with me, and I haven't had my own hard copy set for over six years. That is until my loving girlfriend got me this. And now that I actually have a physical copy of the books, I wanted to go back and work on a project I set out to do way back in April of last year when I was just, you know, a marginally worse YouTuber, and begin ranking the Harry Potter books in tiers. My plan is to reread the series, make an individual video on each of the books, and give them a mini book review before making a case for why this book could be considered the best in the series. Once that's all done, I'll make an official tier list of the main series books, books 1 through 7, and if this gets enough traction, I thought that we could maybe even do that live. That said, as we go through the books, be sure to leave a comment letting me know what you thought about each entry into the Harry Potter series, and be sure to let me know when we get to your favorite. And while you're down there typing away, scroll up just a little bit and hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. And with all that settled, let's start ranking Potter, starting with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, or Sorcerer's Stone, if you are in America like me. Okay, first, I'm not going to lie to you and say that I have a completely non-biased opinion about the series. It's one of my favorites of all time, and while I will point out the flaws present in each book, I honestly don't think there is a single book in the series that I wouldn't recommend, except for The Cursed Child, which isn't real and it's just a figment of my imagination, right? Right. Interestingly, though, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone is actually the last book that I read to myself in the series. I grew up really struggling to read with ADHD and dyslexia, and had a really hard time working through the first book on my own, mostly because I really wanted to read about wizards, and it took a little while for the wizards to really be a prominent fixture in the story. I remember that my older sister actually read this book to me for the first time, and later I watched the movie after that, and I was completely hooked on the series, but it was only after a couple months when I finished Deathly Hollows that I realized I'd never read The Philosopher's Stone to myself, and I went back to reread it. And let me just say that The Philosopher's Stone is a book that fares much better on reread, something I'm not sure I'll be able to say about all the books in the series, but there is just something about book one that's special. As is usual for my reviews, to end on a positive note, we are going to discuss first what did not work. And when I think about the contemporaries of Harry Potter in the young adult fictional universe, I think it's fair to say that the complexity of the themes in the Philosopher's Stone does not exactly compete with the themes present in stories like The Hunger Games, or in my opinion, even The Lightning Thief. And it could just be my dark fantasy loving brain that is thinking that way, but the first Harry Potter book is a pretty simple, good triumphing over evil storyline, and doesn't really amount to much more than that. Quirrell is a pretty flat villain, and Voldemort himself isn't presented with a huge amount of complexity or depth in the first book, and I'd argue that even by the last book, Voldemort's depth isn't exactly enough to dive into, but he does get a bit more complicated as the story goes on. The other issue though, I haven't looked into it as it might have actually been an issue that was taken out of Rowling's control, but it's that Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone is only 17 chapters long, and the book has a lot that it needs to do with such short page length. There is only a total of 223 pages in the book, at least in my copy, and we don't even get to Hogwarts until over 100 pages in, meaning that everything that happens within the castle is moving a mile a minute. And my final critique is that it is clear that Rowling hadn't quite decided what she wanted to do with Harry as a character. In the later books in the series, Harry develops some sass and a bit of an anger streak to balance out his courage and deeply entrenched desire to help him protect his friends, and the world that he loves so much because it's his escape from the Dursleys. But in this book, Harry is clearly designed to be the typical everyman, a kid that other kids reading the book can latch onto or even insert themselves upon, and he's kind of just a bit of a blank slate, which I find jarring considering what I know and how I know he develops in future books. Alright, as much as it pained me to bring up those points, we can finally start talking about what's great about this book, and though I don't typically touch much on the technical writing aspects of the books, though I should in the future. I do want to state that Rowling's prose is perfect for her target audience, and what is even more impressive is when considering that this is her writing debut. 
Her writing is simplistic, yet descriptive enough for young adult readers to develop a picture in their minds, while not getting bogged down by massive blocks of text. The other point I wanted to praise Rowling for is her world building. As I said in, earlier in the video, we don't enter Hogwarts until over 100 pages into the series, but that time isn't spent doing nothing. In fact, when writing a series like Harry Potter, where a whole separate world lives within the one that we know, it is incredibly important to establish to the reader how this secret world is hidden without it feeling like a boring or overly explained exposition dump. And I think Rowling does that pretty well, especially through the introduction of Diagon Alley and through the conversations on the train ride to Hogwarts. By the time we get to Hogwarts, we have a simplistic understanding of how the wizards stay out of view from the muggles. We understand their currency and postage systems, a little bit of wand lore, and an introduction to a few magical beasts and even a bird's eye view of this social systemic problems between muggle-born and pure-blood wizards. I think it's an extremely first, uh, extremely effective first half of the book. But also, since we are for the most part locked into Harry's perspective, we share a lot of the same questions as Harry does, and Rowling sets the story up in a way that we grow to understand the wizarding world as Harry does. The next bit of praise I have is for Rowling's character work, which is pretty good, so long as she bothers to give your character attention. For example, the way she writes Hermione and Ron makes them feel like real children. They're supposed to be 11 with very distinct personalities, and I never once felt like Rowling broke from their character when writing their dialogue or actions. For characters like Dumbledore, Hagrid, McGonagall, and Snape, they're all a little bit of one note as of now, but that also seems to be almost an artistic decision on how Rowling chooses to write adults in the series. People like the Dursleys are cartoonishly evil, and I was surprised at no point that Rowling wrote how, like, Vernon might twirl his mustache villain villainously. It's, it's very clear that she did not put as much effort into writing her adults as she did into writing the children that she really wanted to focus on and develop, and with those children, like I said, I think she developed them extremely well. The last thing that I wanted to praise is that while Rowling likely didn't have everything hammered out in this book for where she wanted the next six entries to go, I think she knew that she eventually wanted to take the series slowly into a darker direction. I found that Philosopher's Stone was pretty good at acclimating you to the darker and more somber moments in the story. From the deaths of the Potters, to the Mirror of Erised, to the fact that Harry straight up murders someone in this book, I at no point felt like there was the crushing or oppressive sadness in these pages, like how I remember feeling during Order of the Phoenix, for instance. But like I said, I love Harry Potter, and I'd recommend you buy the books and read them over and over again, so this review isn't really... the it, it's not really to express a non-biased analysis like others might be. What I do want to end this video on is with an argument as to why each of these books could be considered the best book in the series. So let's start with that. And if I have left out an argument that you feel could support this book, please leave it in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on just like why you think Philosopher's Stone might be the best book. So I think it's important to try really hard to take nostalgia out of it. And once you do that, I think there's a few reasons why you might rank Philosopher's Stone as the best in this series. And the first is the pure and whimsical escapism that this book in the series offers. This is the book that introduces the Hogwarts letter, the thing that so many children at 11 desperately waited for. It introduces us to the wizarding world and presents it to us in the brightest way we'll ever see. Hogwarts as a location never seems as warm or as inviting as it does in this book. And the way we get to explore the Wizarding World with Harry makes every page so exciting and full of adventure. The other thing that works in the Philosopher's Stone favor is that the book does not take a massive amount of time or emotional commitment. This can be said, honestly, for its movie adaptation too. It's the movie I go back and rewatch one of the most times over and over because it's just, it, it's a brain candy type uh, movie. It doesn't require complex thought or emotional investment. This book is not a marathon like Goblet of Fire or Order of the Phoenix are, and it isn't as heavy as those two either. Heck, even the next book in the series, The Chamber of Secrets, is a classist motivated murder mystery that introduces the institution of slavery to the wizarding world. It's not super light. And finally, though this point really only applies on reread, I find that the Philosopher's Stone is so fun to read because we get to see the groundwork of what will eventually amount to major events in the stories and the way they pan out. 
We're introduced to the questions of why Snape hates Harry. We get hints about all the information Dumbledore knows that is yet to be shared with Harry regarding his scar or the role he has to play in the prophecy. And we get to see the creation of the Golden Trio, and there's something heartwarming about seeing the birth of one of the greatest friendships in fiction form right before our eyes. And to me, it's clear that in this book, Rowling hadn't quite mapped out everything that would happen. One question I had, for example, is given the way that Snape and Quirrell interact in this book, why would Voldemort still be so trusting of Snape as a double agent? Um, considering just like how again, like you would have thought Voldemort would have held these remarks in mind. Or another question I wonder is how far did Rowling think she'd go in the development of Neville's character, for instance? But even with those questions, I still had a super fun time rereading Philosopher's Stone, and I'm certain that anyone who hasn't touched any Wizarding World material in years would be unable to stop themselves from having a good time rereading Philosopher's Stone for themselves. But now, I turn the question to you. Where would you rank Philosopher's Stone in terms of the Harry Potter series? Is it one of the best or worst entries? Either way, let me know in the comments below or tweet at me, at Jared Shaw, because I'd love to hear it. And well, guys, that's all I have for this video. If you enjoyed it, once again, be sure to like and subscribe to support the channel so that you can also get a notification when the next entry into Ranking Potter starts. And until next time, peace. Hey there guys, thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed that video and want to see me review more stuff, go ahead and check out my review I recently did on Season 1 of the anime Solo Leveling. Or if you want more Potter, check out this playlist for all things Harry Potter that should be on screen now. Be sure to check me out on my other socials linked down below, and whatever it is you choose to do next, I hope you have a great rest of your day.